Well, that's a good question because I think it's a relative term. Well, um, a micro budget film to me is something around like 50K. 50K and under is what I think is a micro budget. Um, a micro budget film is where you start with an idea and you develop a script and you're so excited that you need to get it into production, but you have no money. You have very limited source resources when you start. Also, it's called an ultra low budget as well. Uh, the ULB is something you'll see a lot times hashtag ULB. Generally, these are uh, more or less passion projects, we like to call them in Hollywood, where they don't have, they're not really connected to a distribution uh, format at that point. They are just an idea that the uh, creators and the producers want to get out there, and they're gonna figure out where the money comes from as they go along, hopefully. Micro budget movie is something shot for $50,000 or under. A micro budget can be the biggest range imaginable. I've heard of people making feature films on like their cell phones for $200, all the way up to like hundreds of thousands of dollars and calling it a micro budget. We live in that lower end of that range. Anything under 30K, that's, that's a micro budget to me. And I know people making movies that think anything under 100K is a micro budget. I've been involved with mostly films under a million dollars. I think I made one over a million. Even when I first started, uh, joysticks in the 80s was 600, 700,000 in reality. Uh, so a micro-budget movie is, for me, has always been making something from the heart. I mean, you really have to love the subject matter, the story, um, the process, because in reality, you're just not going to have the money to do what you want to do. So micro-budget movie making is really at the core of what I love to do which is making something from the heart. That's what it really comes down to. You know, what's it to me? I don't know. It's even relative for me in a way. I mean, I hear people, you know, that are making movies for like under 10K, like 5K, and I think, wow, that's a micro budget. <laughs> if there is some name talent in it, they'll usually only be in it for a few scenes, usually a day of shooting and uh, there's no major studio or anything like that behind it. It's done independent. So let's say I got like 25K and most of that money would be going towards crew location. And if I was lucky enough to get a name talent for maybe like a day or two and they can charge me maybe a couple grand and I would be able to give them a day player roles just so I can have a name in my film. Everybody wears more than one hat. We all chip in to do what we have to do. I know on my own productions, I've literally done makeup, sound, lighting, grip, director, producer, actor, musician. I've literally done it all because that's what you do. You can make a film with like four people and that's what you get used to doing. Some people think anything under a million is a micro budget. So it kind of depends on where you are. The the sound man, which I usually come in as a sound guy for that. Um, I will come in, if I'm lucky, I have a boom up. Sometimes I don't even have a boom up. So basically I have a small kit, um, usually at least two labs and a boom. Time code slate, like, because I'm fortunate enough to be able to afford one, but you don't necessarily need one. Then I look at the camera package. There's usually a, a DP who's actually operating the camera, which is not actually true in bigger films. In bigger films, the DP often does not operate the camera. So you have a DP who's operating the camera and his main function is to just frame it. And next to him, if he's lucky, is a, a first AC. His job is just to focus it. And the reason why this is two jobs, by the way, not that you can't do it yourself, is because you can say a lot in a film just by who you choose to focus on. You wanna focus on the person in the back, then you want to focus on the person in the front. That's called a rack focus. Those kinds of things, um, those subtleties of filmmaking uh, are really great to have a first AC. There's never a second AC. It's very rare. And then after that, there's usually a couple of kids who are helping out with lighting. And then there's your talent and your director and maybe for lucky a producer. 
Um, it's a very, very small group of people. Um, it can be as little as, you know, four or five people in a set. Let's take uh, my movie, The Scam, for example. Um, my crew size, I believe, was maybe like under 10 people. And I would name, to me, the most important roles for me as a director. Of course, you need the director. He's the conductor. You need uh, your DP, that's the uh, director of photography. He's a person that's controlling the camera and the lights. Uh, now I learn my DP needs his gaffer. The gaffer is his right hand man. Those two go hand in hand, so you do need that. You can't scam out on those two positions, in my personal experience. Micro budget movies are usually completely non union as far as crew goes. Sometimes they're SAG. There's a SAG classification called SAG ULB. Uh, where the actors are basically paid around 200 a day. The only reason that a micro-budget production, you know, would do that is if there is some kind of name talent attached to it. If you have uh, that small of a budget, you're going to be uh, looking at things that have a small cast that don't have a lot of FX and explosions and car chases, that don't have a lot of locations. All of your choices really are sort of tied to your budget, I think. Uh, the smaller projects, you could be anywhere from two people to about 15, I would say. Uh, if you do a full skeleton crew, there's literally a camera guy and another guy running sound. Sometimes it's the same guy, you never know. I've only, I only work with one one-man crew, and uh, so I barely count him. He's an outlier. But for the most part, they're normally around four or five. You do the very basic necessities, because in a typical film crew, you have all your departments. You have your sound department, which on a small boat crew, a lot of times is one guy. Your camera department is one guy. You're lucky if you have a production assistant. You're lucky if you have an assistant director. Typically, there's about four people, and that's it. That's what you get. That's all you need, though, really, when we break it down. Sometimes it's good to have a free pair of hands. If it's a micro budget for you, it's a micro budget for you. Well, that's kind of the answer. Wow. <laughs> um, I have been a part of uh, maybe 40 uh, micro budget features. Uh, you know, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I would say enough. <laughs> I have been in over. I don't know the exact number of micro budget films I've worked on or been a part of, but it's been a lot. Oh, wow. I've been a part of so many micro budget productions. I can't even recall. Probably a hundred over the years. The first five movies that I was in, they were these micro budget indie films, and I never saw anything. And it's a shame because as an actor, you're doing these for the footage, for the opportunity. And you're on set, so you get used to it, but at the same time, it makes it really tough because you never get anything from it. My entrance into film was pretty much by accident. I was a record producer and a songwriter, and I was playing in a lot of bands. And as I got older, it just became more and more difficult to make a living as a musician. Somebody said, well, you know, if you, it has to be easier to make money. And someone said, well, you should go into film. They pay you twice as much and expect half the effort. <laughs> and I say, well, that sounds good to me. I didn't know at that time I wanted to be a filmmaker per se, um, but I worked in post for a number of years and then became a sound mixer for production. And it was through the process of working in post and as a production sound mixer that I had this amazing education. I was working with directors and producers and DPs and I was sitting behind them so I am watching everything they do right and everything that they do wrong and how they do what they do. And it finally came to me that even though in my past as an artist, I primarily worked in songwriting and music, that I could, uh, I have an entire new lease on life of being able to express my ideas through this, through film, which I had just simply learned from being on set for so many years. I have edited many. directed about a dozen. Cut. So yeah, quite a few. <laughs> um, although there are others out there that have done more. <laughs> Did that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs>
The micro budget films that I watch are the films that my friends make. Every now and again, somebody will make a, make a suggestion, a recommendation of something, but it always comes with this little afterthought of like, it's pretty good for the budget. And I'm, I'm always trying to check out anything. I watch everything from the biggest Hollywood blockbusters to the smallest, lowest budget, but mostly because it's my friends that are in them and making them. The way I watch micro budget films would be uh, if the story catches me, like if I'm on Amazon or Netflix or Hulu or any of these online sites where they, you know, uh, put up a lot of these films, I read the synopsis and if the synopsis catches me and, you know, it looks like it's good quality, I will watch it because a lot of good films come from the micro budget world that normally, typically Hollywood don't do because they want to do a part three, four or five, six, seven, eight, nine. Fast Furious type films, which nothing wrong with it, but you know, they don't, they don't want to take chances with new stories. I haven't seen that many lately. I mean, I used to when I was a lot younger. I'm trying to find where actually you can find them. Finding them uh, for me is, is, has always been difficult. I'd like to see more actually. Yeah. I mean, I have friends that uh, are making micro budget movies and yeah, if I, if you're my friend, and you make a movie, it's a good chance I'll watch it, as long as it's something I'm interested in. That's, that's often the uh, test for me. It's not how much the movie costs, it's whether I'm interested in watching it or not. If, it, if I'm not interested, it could be a, you know, a $5,000 movie or a $5 million movie. I don't want to sit through it. These days, you mostly find micro-budget movies online, uh, streaming. You know, there Amazon Prime, for example, you know, has become a platform where, you know, almost anybody can upload their movie there and have it, you know, available to millions of viewers. Um, it's really kind of even the playing field. Um, you don't always make a ton, ton of money there, but your movie's right next door to, you know, Fast and the Furious. So it's kind of cool like that. Back in the day, we used to try to, you know, scour the shelves at the rental place, or, or we would watch it on the weird channel late at night, and they were very hard to find, but it's much easier to find nowadays. Uh, a smart film director will write scripts, uh, ultra low budget scripts, that have very targeted markets. A really good example, um, I did a film uh, with C. Thomas Howell, C. Thomas Howell and Judd, uh, Judd Nelson from Breakfast Club. And it was a World War II epic that we shot um, in someone's backyard. I am not kidding. We shot an entire naval ocean-based war epic about a submarine in a backyard with a giant green screen and green screen tables and green screen this and all just natural sunlight because we had no money. And we, those, uh, the guys that made the movie were just CGI guys and they put in all of the background, all of the, the, the mechanics and the machinery that we didn't have, that we didn't have on set. I'm, it's a great film. I'm not saying it's not a great film, but what is important from the distributor's perspective is that that this film starred C. Thomas Howell, stars uh, Judd Nelson. And those names, we can move the needle, and it's a niche film. There are people that love to consume World War II films. It's maybe not my cup of tea, may not be your cup of tea, but there is a market for it. So we could present to this niche market, here is a movie for your consumption. You don't have to get a uh, hundred percent of your audience. If you sell to 3% of your audience, the available audience, if you sell to 3% of your audience, that's a huge market share. If you could get 1% of, uh, of your market audience, you are still making a successful film. If the film costs you $100,000 to make this movie and you're, you can get, I don't know, let's say $10 a unit, how many units will you need to get that, that money back? Not that many units, you know? When you consider how many kids go to college, if you sold one disc to everyone that went to your college, you'd probably already be making a profit. So what I'm saying here is, if you're worried about recapping and getting money back from your film or successfully distributing it, and you don't have luck with a major distributor, make a film with a niche market and 
targeted to them. A great example I'd mentioned earlier, mid 90s, the, the Jonah Hill film. It's about skateboarding. It's about skateboarding life. And he made it for that community. Now, luckily for him, the stories that exist in mid 90s speak to many, many people. In fact, I've, I've never skateboarded, yet I could totally relate to many of the things that are happening in that film. But, but I wasn't even the target audience. If he had just sold it to just people that skateboarded, that that film was would were uh, easily uh, made back its money and made a profit. Most of the movies I've made have been distributed by a traditional means. Um, you know, sometimes a limited theatrical release. You know, followed by DVD and more recently streaming. Um, uh, one of the last projects that I did pretty much came out uh, exclusively on streaming. Uh, it was on Amazon Prime for a while and then uh, moved into, you know, uh, submitted it to Film Hub and it went through several other platforms like that. I think Amazon Prime, in, in one way, it's a really good thing. Um, it's democratized uh, film distribution. Now pretty much anyone, you know, without access to, you know, studios or, you know, major distributors can self-distribute their projects. So once you have your film made, you need to distribute it. And before that, you need to make sure that you've got it yourself legally set up for distribution. One of the big factors a lot of people don't budget for is a lawyer. You need to go through and have everything cleared. For instance, there may be things in the film that need to be cleared. It could be music. It could be you might have filmed a, a sign. You might have filmed a product with a label. You might not have all the release forms for background actors or, uh, or, or even your lead actors. All of those types of things need to be dealt with. And there's many, many more things that lawyers do in that prospect that I don't even understand or know. I just know that's his job. He knows them because a distributor will, won't even look at a film that's not properly cleared. You could have an amazing film. And if you do not have very well-defined clearances for all of that work, a distributor may just turn it down without even looking at it. I'm sorry, we can't, we can't accept this. Why? Again, liability. The distributor does not want to become liable, does not want to invest money, their money, into distributing a film um, if, it, if it gets pulled from the shelves. There's a website called uh, Film Hub. You know, they're basically an aggregator, but they don't take money up front. Uh, they basically take, I, I don't know, 10 or 20 percent of, you know, whatever the movie makes and you get the other 80 and then they present it to multiple platforms. There's also, uh, it used to be more prevalent on uh, physical DVD. Like, you know, you could go into Walmart and find a lot of these movies. Um, I mean, there was a time between like 2010 and 2012 where, you know, you couldn't walk down a Walmart you know, uh, DVD bin without seeing five or six of my movies. That's tough. I think part of that, my answer would be related to what kind of movie is it? Because that might change how I would spend that money. But um, in theory, I would either aim for a select few really key festival, niche festivals. If you like, if you made a horror film, the big horror film festivals, I would try to get in one of those because sometimes that can be a springboard and do promotion for you. Yeah, it's about knowing your audience because that's where you're gonna put your dollars. And so if your audience is, you know, a big social media audience and you know they're all on a certain, say, Facebook page, maybe you'll buy a, an ad that targets that page and that audience. So that I would be very specific about targeting where I would put my money. I'd say most micro-budget uh, filmmakers are doing their promotion through social media. You know, um, usually there's not much money there. So, you know, they're doing, you know, Facebook posts, they're creating pages, they're creating Twitter accounts, Instagram, and they're, you know, joining groups and, you know, online communities and, you know, trying to promote their movie that way. Social media is a really tough thing to try and get around. You want to promote as much as you can, but people kind of get tired of it. If you keep putting out the same thing again and again and again, people are like, okay, I get it, you made this thing. But you're like, no, but I'm still making it. This is the most important thing in my life. And it's really aggravating that people just 
whenever they either stop caring or they just like, just give it a like, it doesn't cost you anything. Just like it, come on, just like it. Press the button, just like, share, please. If you have no money budgeted for marketing, um, I would argue you're making a mistake. I would say if you only have 5K, put some of it aside for marketing. I know uh, that goes against the school of put every dollar on the screen, but if you put every dollar on the screen and you have nothing for marketing, then you're left doing nothing but uh, social media. And unless you're one of the masters who can work it to make things go madly viral, how you do that sh seems to be changing day by day, uh, it's going to be very hard to get eyeballs on your movie. I think the problem that most filmmakers get into is, you know, most filmmakers, your circle of friends online is mostly going to be other filmmakers and actors and, you know, other people that are trying to get their product out there to the public instead of the public you're actually trying to reach. The next problem, too, is, well, um, how do I go about finding a distributor or how do I distribute myself? I don't know all the answers in this one. I'm still learning about distribution all the time. I can tell you that if your film is 85 to $150,000, you must take a portion of that money and put it toward talent that has some name. We like to call it around here, moving the needle. We need to have a name on this film that we could put on the box that's gonna move the needle. Now, it can be a TV star from the 90s. Um, it could be a ca famous character actor who's been appearing in a bunch of films. It doesn't have to be a super lead. It just has to have someone with some uh, name recognition because a distributor is going to be looking for talking points. The distributor does not sell the movie. The distributor sells the poster. What is on the poster? There is uh, the title. There is the image depicting what the film is about. There are the names of those who are appearing in the film. And then there's the director credits. And if you don't have a very famous director credit, I mean, even there's so many great directors that are not household names, then where do you lie? It has to be in the title. It has to be in the imagery, which tells the story. And most importantly, there has to be some names in there that people go, oh, I remember that person. I'm interested in that person. I'd love to see what they're up to now. That's how you can line up distribution. And then when you go to, uh, when you talk to agents and distributor agents, this is, uh, these are the things you're going to be discussing in the film. It's kind of funny because the least important part of the movie is, is the movie good in this particular instance. In the very first discussions you have, it's more about what assets can we push onto the general public that would make them interested. When I'm making a micro budget movie, um, it pretty much has to start at the script level. You know, I have to be aware that, you know, I'm making, you know, I'm creating a project, you know, for this budget level. So, you know, I keep uh, locations that I have access to in mind. Um, I keep, you know, actors that I've worked with before on similar projects in mind. You know, I keep genre in mind, you know, and, and of course, you know, the marketplace changes year for year, year to year, but, you know, some years horror is doing better, some years comedy, some years, you know, indie drama, you know, just depends. Um, more blood around the, the top of the wrist where the, yeah, all, of, yeah. Micro budgets are uh, some of the best sets to work on because they they are very collaborative. Um, generally, there's a lot of volunteers or people working for very little pay on those shoots, and they're all there bringing uh, what they can offer to a film uh, in a sense of community and a sense of teamwork. It's a really good option for anyone on crew or in production to do. Uh, these periodically because you meet new people who are especially interested in the creative process, especially interested in making things that are um, of value or, or, or new and exciting. Um, because as you go up in, in the film kind of hierarchy, you kind of hit this commercial area where you are making much better money, but they're, they're commercials and they're, they don't have the same level of uh, creative um, uh, some kind of creative appeal 
um, that you might have even on a, a lower budget, say, horror film or a micro budget film in general? So some of the uh, advantages of working on these films is you can do a lot more, meaning like there's not a lot of limitations. There are a lot of limitations, but there's not, meaning like your actor might be willing to do a couple stunts, which if I had a budget, it's so many different rules. You gotta block off a street. You gotta have, heli I'm not helicopters. You gotta have cops. You gotta have fire department just to do like a, a, a car, car chase, just going, you know, just down one street. But when you don't have the budget for all that, you can just say, hey, can you do this for me? And they can say yes or no, and most likely they'll do it, and you don't need any of that. So that's some good parts to working with that. And, you know, there's some bad parts too. Uh, over the years, I've been very lucky to be able to pass on things. That's uh, It's a weird thing to say, but whenever you're first coming up, you pretty much say yes to everything. And being, being who I am and the way that I look, they're like, all right, take your shirt off and then we're going to kill you. And then you're going to go be a jerk to these people or I'm just going to play a cop. And I've played cop a lot. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I've built a lot of credits and a lot of real, made some good money playing a cop. And I don't mind, but I tell you what, with coming the time that I've put in and a little bit of success, I actually get to say no to things. And that is a beautiful thing, trust me. Some of the cool things about making a micro budget movie is, well, one, you know, the financial investment is low. So like if as a filmmaker, you're ever going to take, you know, like some crazy creative risks, that's where to do it. I mean, once you start getting into, you know, you know, million dollar budgets and, you know, higher, there's a lot more on the line financially. You know, you have a, you have a, and even at the micro budget level, you have a responsibility uh, to return your investors money. But on a micro budget production, you know, there's a lot less money involved. The risk is much smaller financially. So you can do some things that you typically might not do on a larger budget. Um, so I think that's cool. And usually, again, because there's not that much money involved, um, the investors are pretty hands off. You know, out of the, you know, whatever, uh, 16 plus movies I've directed, you know, I've probably only had, you know, like, you know, strong input from producers on, you know, four or five. One of my favorite things about acting in a lower budget movie is the freedom that you get. I've been on bigger sets and I've been on the smallest of sets. And whenever you're on the smaller sets, they let you take these chances. They let you have fun with it, whether it be improv a little bit here and there or just getting bigger opportunities that you wouldn't get. I've been on tons of movies and TV shows that were bigger budget and I literally have like a line here, a line there, and I better get all the words exactly as they wrote it or they're gonna make me do it again. But on lower budget, you get to have fun with it. I mean, you get to have bigger parts. You get to actually create these characters and have some fun. A lot of times I have some of my most fun on these lower budgets. Can you make a great movie on a micro budget? Absolutely. Look, you're never gonna be Steven Spielberg, but Steven Spielberg is never going to be you. So what is it about you that is unique and special? It's the way that you've seen the world. It's your life experiences. It's the places that you walked, the places that you went to, and how you saw, what you chose to look at in life. Those things you can bring right to your script and right to your frame. Okay, Mr. Horton, tell me about your movie. What is this? <laughs> Larry Clark uh, was a still photographer in the 70s who really captured street life and young people living in New York in the village in the 70s. He finally got himself a movie camera and he made a film called Kids where he just put his heart and took all his experience living in New York and living at the, on the sidewalks of New York and just watching that move through the camera. And that film is a unique personal expression that only he can do. That's the beauty of great micro-budget filmmaking. It really makes you think hard about the process. It really forces you to be creative in ways that I don't think you'd think of being creative because if you had the money to do certain things, you would go do that. Micro-budget filmmaking, for instance, how do you make a dolly shot work You know, when you can't afford a dolly? Um, what can you do in terms of a physical effect that you don't have the money to create 
CGI, it really makes you think creatively, to say the least, from as actors, um, directors, writers. It can, it could probably either, it either brings out the best or the worst of you, one of the two. And if you want that kind of a challenge, I guarantee you micro-budget filmmaking will do that to you. You know what? My best creative experience will be my first feature film that I ever directed. And the reason why is because that was my first. It was called The Scam. And it was a great experience because I was at the, I think at the time I was like 24, 25 years old. And I raised a little bit of money to shoot it. And I was able to accomplish at the time my dream. And my dream was to shoot a feature film. Making micro budget movies used to be a much more viable uh, business plan. You know, I was making them for a company uh, for, oh man, between 2010 and like 2014. Um, I probably, you know, I directed maybe 10 to 12 movies for these guys in that period and edited a ton more. Um, they were making movies for, you know, anywhere between $25,000 and fifty to $60,000. Um, there would usually be one or two names in them. Um, you know, the names would shoot for one to two days and, you know, they would be in supporting roles. And they were making money on these. And they had a deal uh, with a distributor. Um, so they had a, you know, a set amount of money that they were going to make per movie. And, you know, some did better, some did worse. But at least according to them, you know, they, the, the worst they ever did was break even. And some of those movies made quite a bit of money, especially in foreign. We, we thought that with the new technologies and streaming that getting, in the old days, getting your movie out via distribution was really important. Obviously, there were film distributors back in the day when you made a micro-budget movie. And there was only a few of them that you can get to. So basically, they were gatekeepers. There was only a few that, you know, like I said, you can get your movie out. And when the internet changed everything as, as we thought it was going to, um, we thought everyone's going to go on the internet and can see my movie, so let's just get it to the internet so people can see it. And found out that it's it's almost the same paradigm as before in that if people aren't aware of it, where to go see it, how to buy it, how to access it, um, all of a sudden there were a new gatekeeper. Uh, Netflix is a gatekeeper. Hulu is a gatekeeper. YouTube is a ge gatekeeper. They spend money or people are aware of that brand so they can go see movies according to that brand, that distributor. Um, it's tough. So yes, I think that micro-budget movie making can be a viable business model but only if you can support it with knowledge and talent and uh, skill and all of the things that make for a, a, a quality product and B, good sales tactics to get that product out to people. Because you have to do that on a constant regular basis, all of that together as a package. Uh, otherwise, I think it's, uh, it's something to do for fun. Micro budget, is it viable? I want to say yes. And the reason why it is, is if you can shoot something, and the reason why I use the number 50K and under is because that's a good range to flip your money. Meaning like there's a lot of different platforms where if you, let's just use the number 50K and I shoot a movie and I get it on like maybe 10 platforms like Amazon, uh, and a bunch of other online platforms. And each platform every month is making me between a thousand bucks, a thousand bucks each. That might not sound like a lot, but you times that by 10, 10 times a thousand, what is that? 10,000. And then for the whole year, you just made a hundred thousand dollars and that money still keeps going the year after. It might go down a little and a little, but you still, you'll make your money back. 
Making micro budget films can be a very low level viable business model. None of us are gonna get rich, but you get to do something really cool. You get to make films. I mean, you should be in it for the passion of it. And in most cases, I do everything for free. A lot of my films cost me money. I never see a dime back, and I just want people to watch it. So it's, you're not gonna get rich, but you will be able to make films. You get to control your own content. You don't have to worry about buying film anymore. Everything's digital. You don't have to worry about a distribution. You don't have to worry about, you know, all these other things. You know, you don't have to have a studio sponsor. You could literally just go out and make it and you could actually put it out there for everybody to see. In the last couple of years, things have changed. I made a movie a year ago and basically at the same budget level, same kind of cast. Um, production value is actually higher, um, probably the highest of any of the productions I've done. It's a good script. Uh, the market, and then I put it out in the marketplace and found the marketplace had changed. Um, you know, because of things like Amazon Prime, Amazon Video Direct, and you know, filmmakers being able to get their movies into the marketplace with little to no gatekeeping, the marketplace has been completely flooded with material. So you have a movie that, you know, maybe it would have made, you know, 200, 300,000 four years ago. Now, you know, that same exact movie will make, you know, 50,000 or, you know, less. I mean, there are films out there that, you know, five years ago would have been making, you know, three, four thousand dollars a month. Now they're making like two hundred dollars a month. And I, I think that that is a symptom of an overcrowded marketplace. Oh, wow. I've, I feel like I've kind of done it all. I have, I've had office jobs and desk jobs. I have had jobs as a server. I've worked retail. Um, yeah, pretty much whatever I got at the time that worked for my schedule and or worked for whatever I needed at the time, that's what you do. So I've been lucky enough that, you know, over the last eight years, um, I've worked exclusively in the industry. You know, I haven't had a, you know, day job. Um, but prior to that, um, I worked at a coffee shop uh, for years, you know, over a decade. So I pretty much, you know, I would, you know, work there, you know, 4 a.m. to noon, and then I'd work on my movies. You know, sometimes I'd shoot movies on the weekends. You know, I'd be in control of this, you know, like, you know, 10 man crew and cast and, you know, running the show. And then, you know, I'd be back at the coffee shop the next day, 5 a.m., you know, you want foam on that latte. <laughs> But I don't regret that time at the coffee shop. Um, you know, they were very flexible. You know, it was a it was a good good side gig. Um, and then in more recent years, you know, I'm still working within the industry, but I have gotten a lot of freelance work editing. So I edit other features. You know, I do promos and stuff like that, and that's how I keep, you know, paying the bills while I'm in between projects. So most of the movies that I've been a part of, most of the micro-budget movies I've been a part of were equity financed or private financed. Most of the time, um, it was through people I knew. You know, I was working as a camera operator when I first moved to LA and I was working on a shoot with a producer and we got to talking and he found out I was a writer, asked if I had a, you know, a zombie script laying around and I didn't. He asked me if I wanted to write one, I said, sure. And, you know, long story short is, you know, he came around and you know financed edges of darkness for uh, $25,000 you know and you know then you know I had a similar situation with trap a uh, similar situation with monsters in the woods and a similar situation with uh, death day I would find one key producer and they would you know finance the whole thing or they would find other people to chip in and help finance the movies and then I, you know I've been a hired gun on you know probably a dozen features it seems like with the micro budget productions, it's just people getting together saying, hey, if, if you donate your time and I donate my time, we could, we could make it for next to nothing. And it's almost like you're just trying to get anybody to donate anything that they can. I know every now and again, I have to call in favors and I feel kind of bad doing it because then I end up owing somebody something. But that's okay because I've been in a ton of other people's movies. I've done anything that I can to help. I will go on your set. I will be your grip, your gaffer, but then you might have to come be my grip one day. And it's 
all about just helping each other out because there's so many independent filmmakers out there that are really stretched thin. It's either that or I open up my pocketbook and pay for it. Now, I got no problem doing that, but if I don't have the funds in the bank, it makes it kind of tough. Of the movies that I've produced on my own, uh, the most financially successful was probably Edges of Darkness. Um, you know, like I said, we made that for 25000 in its first year. Um, you know, the sales on it were, you know, well over a hundred. Um, you know, of course we didn't see all that money, but <laughs> that it made it. Um, and then uh, for others, you know, the Talking Dog movie, I was talking about socks. Um, I think that that surpassed it by quite a bit. Um, you know, I don't, I wasn't a producer on that one, so I really don't have the final numbers, but I know that it was, I know that it was really high. The biggest problem with micro budget films is, uh, not understanding your liability, your your exposure. Um, it is not really legal to have people working on set for free. Uh, it's not legal to have them working at less than minimum wage. And it's certainly not legal for them to work overtime without proper compensation. <laughs> In a perfect world, you're working with your friends who will not come back later and make demands on you. But at some point when you're filling out a film crew, you are going to have to reach out to other people that are friends of friends or, or friends of friends of friends or, or who just want to volunteer to be on a set. And uh, they have the best intentions when they do. But making film is grueling work. It's going into, it's going into battle. It's a war. It, uh, and it can be very exhausting for people and personalities can flare. So long after even the film is shot, one of those people can come back and file a grievance saying, hey, I worked these days, I was never paid. And at that point, your liability is wide open because the penalties and fees uh, associated with not paying an employee uh, can be astronomical. A good case in point, uh, entertainment. Um, which is a large corporation that made a lot of content for uh, like Discovery Channel and, and other things like that. They hired me for one day, uh, and that's a large company by the way, uh, hired me for one day and that was $450 is all they owed me. I worked a half day as a sound guy, easy deal. They did not pay. By the time I went through the process of filing a grievance to get paid, the bill came to $12,500. And I was just one person of probably 200. I just got a letter in the mail that entertainment is going into liquidation because they owe literally millions of dollars to people at this point with fees, etc. And that I am welcome to attend the auction and, <laughs> and make my claim. So that's an extreme case scenario where someone was extremely negligent and did not respect the employment laws. But even on a micro budget, you have to be very careful. One of the major problems uh, with micro budget films is, you know, especially on the crew side, um, there's usually low to no pay for a lot of these positions. So you're either, you know, like, you know, paying somebody to do a job and then they have to perform three or four other people's jobs, or they're not really even making, you know, what's a legal wage. You know, um, it's what they call, you know, like favor for favor. Like you'll have a, uh, you know, someone come in and help you gaff your movie and then, you know, you'll go help them gaff their movie or edit their movie or, you know, what it is. There's a lot of trading, a lot of bartering going on between filmmakers making these films. And then, of course, there's other filmmakers that, you know, literally just don't have any money and they're getting people to volunteer their time for free. I personally don't think there's anything wrong with that when you're starting out, you know, do a couple movies like that, you know, call the favors. But... Personally, you know, if if you're making money on these projects, you know, I think you have a moral responsibility to, you know, pay your cast and crew, you know, at, at, at least a legal wage. You know, it might be low, but at least you're paying. Um, so at least that's what I try to do now. I don't think it's necessarily taking advantage of cast and crew. It's if I only have a thousand dollars to go in between a certain amount of people that's all i have so it's not taking advantage i can't give you what i don't have so when i'm working on the film and 
even when I'm hired as a crew, especially these micro budget, they put out the rate, either I can accept the rate or I can decline. And if I accept it, I should go into the situation with a positive mindset. Ah, the good old exposure. Working for exposure. It'll be good exposure. It's, uh, that's, that's kind of an embarrassing thing where people still say that it's, I've gotten plenty of exposure. I've been on things and they, they still act like they're doing you a favor. Like, please come do this thing. I literally had somebody tell me that I'd be wearing a gorilla suit, carrying a woman, running, picking her up and running off into the woods. It's like a Bigfoot thing. And they're like, it'll be great exposure. This gets million views on YouTube. It was like, but I'm gonna be wearing a gorilla suit and you want me to pick up a woman and run into the woods for a 12 hour shoot day for exposure? That's uh, it's not the kind of exposure that I want. Well, here's what I'll say about that. Um, <laughs> as actors, we're in the business of acting for a living, which means we need to make a wage. There are exceptions to that rule, and they need to be exceptions by choice. For example, uh, an actor or an actress who has no credits, and you need credits in order to show that you can be on set and function and do the job and whatnot. That's a, there's a reason there to potentially sign up quite happily to be on set for a film as an actor or an actress and do it for the credit. The credit is the reward. I mean, there are rewards to doing your craft besides monetary awards, right? There's other, there are other personal rewards. I, I've always wanted to play this kind of role. Uh, then there's, you know, getting credit if, you, if that's something that you need. So if it's, if it's that sort, if it's a, if it's a totally consensual kind of a thing um, and everyone is clear about it, I don't necessarily think that that's a problem because then you're basically working as a volunteer and being a volunteer is a perfectly legal thing to do. So from that perspective, I, I don't see that there's anything wrong with it in theory. Uh, if every movie you make as a filmmaker, now I'm jumping from actor to filmmaker, if every film you make, you don't pay any of your actors ever, that's a pro I think that's abuse in a way because especially if you're putting your movies out to market and attempting to make money off of them because now you're making money off of these people who are putting their art into your film and that's yeah then so serial refusal to pay actors I think would be a problem for me. <laughs> It's a shame that there are some filmmakers and producers out there that do take advantage of their cast and crew. I know I've spent long, long hours on set that I wasn't supposed to, done a lot of things that I was never reimbursed for, including not even getting my own footage. So it's a shame that there are people out there that do it, but there's a lot of good people out there that are just trying to make films and they don't have the funds to do it. So they're trying to just be good people and at the end of the day, there is gonna be people that are taking advantage of them and that's a bummer. So on a micro budget, stick to the people you know and stick to the people that you truly trust and make sure that they understand going in that it's going to be difficult. Um, you have to be really clear. You have to be very vocal. I think any low budget filmmaker, if, if you've come to your cast and crew and say, hey, um, this is what I have to make a movie. I want to make it. Um, if I have some money to give you, we can do that. But more than anything, I think you're offering somebody an opportunity. It's usually somebody young who would like a credit for bumping up what they would normally do. If it's a PA who wants to be an assistant director, you're giving him an opportunity to be an assistant director where he normally wouldn't be able to do that. Um, Micro-budget movie making is that. You're allowing an opportunity for somebody to do something that they normally couldn't do. It, it, it's just you just don't have the money to pay people. And I think you're honest with them about what you have to pay them. They can say yay or nay. Um, you're going to put in the time. You're going to put in 10 to 12 hours a day. If, if you're telling them I need you for 10 hours, you're telling them. Uh, I don't think you're taking advantage of anybody. If, if It's like anything else. If you're lying to them and saying, hey, you know, uh, I got this money. or, or you're, Even if you're paying one person and you're not paying another, 
that's a difficult situation. And I don't necessarily know if you want to get stuck doing something like that. But I, I don't believe that micro-budget filmmakers want to take advantage of anybody other than they're trying to make a movie. Don't offer people uh, producer credits because the problem that they don't understand is that if they become a producer and it's listed, later on they then become liable for for whatever damages may be incurred uh, in a later in a later litigation. Not necessarily, but possibly. They have opened themselves up for that. Um, a lot of times people give out producer credits in order to raise money, in order to uh, to facilitate infrastructure. I do it too. We all do, we all have to do what we have to do to make our movie. But when you do say, hey, if you do this, I will give you producer credit, you must explain to them that they are exposed at that point and that you have to work together as a team to, uh, to lessen that exposure for everybody so that you have a safe, happy crew, safe, happy cast, and that SAG won't come and, and just mess up your head for, for, for the project. On a micro budget production, you almost always have your key players multitasking, you know, performing more than their specific task. You know, as a director, you know, I usually also write my productions. Um, nine times out of 10, I'm editing the movie, um, you know, and it, it's really a practical thing. It's, it's not that I feel like I'm the best editor in the world. I mean, I think I'm a very good editor, but you know, post-production is very expensive. And in order to hire an editor of my caliber, it would go, you know, well beyond the budget of the film. So I, that's why I typically edit my productions. Not, not because I have to, but because, you know, financially it just makes the most sense. So some of the roadblocks in micro budget movies is money. That's the biggest roadblock. And meaning like you are limited to what you can do. Like you might, in the script, you might want this mansion. So, but your budget, you can only afford a home. So you can't get this mansion that you want with this nice high ceilings. So limitations is the biggest thing is money. Money is the biggest limitation. One of the worst experiences that I've ever had is one of the main things with lower budgets is that they don't do all of the correct steps. We're out there without permits, waving around guns and knives and everything else. I was literally driving down the highway, hanging out the side of the vehicle with the with an M16 shooting it at somebody while the guy's in the car, in the car next to me just pointing a camera in live traffic in, in, in Los Angeles, down in like South Los Angeles. And it's just, it, it's ridiculous the stuff that we're doing because they're like, ah, oh, we'll just go steal the shot, we'll go steal that. And then it's bad enough, I never got the footage from it. At least if I'm gonna be doing that, at least give me the footage. Like God, I gotta watch the news to see see myself maniac with gun on the highway. Uh, don't be the director who does nothing but pizza every day. That's that's not good. Give your actors a reason to be excited about coming to set, even if it's just the food. And I know, um, however you can make it happen. On, on Deadly Revisions, my I, my co-producer was uh, in the kitchen cooking unique and different exciting meals every single day for my crew. It's one of the ways we tried to keep that budget down. Um, God bless her. <laughs> so, and that just, but just that variety and having that uh, happen, the, the crew and the actors really appreciated it. They do. They're there for a long time, you know, if it's eight hours, if it's longer than eight hours, you want to make sure they're happy, you know, in the tummy. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so on my IMDb, I've been the sound man for over a hundred shorts and films and television shows. Um, and I produced and directed a few of them. I can tell you the biggest mistake that most people make in filmmaking is they don't rehearse. A complete lack of rehearsal with their talent. Um, that is the biggest one. A director that really truly cares about what's going on needs, needs to have time with his cast beyond just a table read. 
they need a time and a place where they can practice blocking, where they can work with the um, where they can work with the costume, where they can work with the props. And the more days and times that you spend developing that part of the film before you shoot, uh, the much better your film's gonna be. Because then, because what happens a lot in micro budget films is since, since they, and if they don't put that part in, they spend the wide shots rehearsing the scene. And, and then we just do a bunch of wides until they kind of know their lines and they kind of know they're blocking. And by the time we get into coverage, they sort of understand what the scene is about. They're just discovering it at that point. But great acting can only take place after the actor has done all that first, after he's uh, expended all of his creativity, and now he's scraping for something or she's scraping for something new. Ooh, the, the, the common things that you see is whenever um, just people aren't, don't seem to be doing anything. It's like a lot of people standing around, there's no leader, there's no direction. Everybody calls themselves a producer because they're all people that came together for, and they're, they're all producers on it, yet you don't know who anybody is and, and there's no food and it's, it's just like, oh, when are we gonna start? And then you get there and you realize that you're not gonna start from nine hours from now because like, oh, we just wanted to have you here just in case. But yet there's no, I, I'm, an, I'm not a diva. I don't need a dressing room. I don't need all this stuff. Just give me a chair to sit down in and then maybe keep me up there. Maybe give me a schedule. That's all I need. Whenever you show up and there's no schedule, there's no spot to sit down, no food, and we're expected to be there for like 12 to 16 hours, bad signs. I really don't know what the future holds. The marketplace changes so rapidly. I mean, just in the last year, things have changed so much and there's so many new platforms to put things out on and there's so many new filmmakers. And on one hand is a really exciting time. You know, you can go out there and you know, pretty much anybody has the ability to make a movie now. I mean, you can shoot 4K quality footage on a, on a phone now. I mean, and there are major filmmakers that are doing that. So, you know, so in a way it's democratized the, the playing field, but on the other hand, everybody can make a movie <laughs> and, there, and, and, and does, and there are tons out there and it can be really hard to compete. And I guess that really just means that if you're going to have any kind of longevity or you know, you're gonna be successful, you really, really have to concentrate on making good material. I think it could get really interesting. Uh, as we've seen major directors using cell phones, you know, to make movies. Um, that, you know, because anyone with a cell phone can make a movie, uh, I think that that and and if those kinds of movies can be seen in theaters and seen be seen as legit and as award-winning pieces of art that uh, you know legit directors make blah 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 I see no reason for that not to become kind of a mainstay of what modern cinema becomes. I think the micro budgets are just going to get better and better, to be honest with you. It's amazing what you could do with very basic editing software because that's really where it's at. And with the cameras getting cheaper that are looking better and better, we're really coming up with some really cool high quality stuff that's done on the cheap. Then it just boils down to actors and locations and of course a good script. That is the most important one because if it was a good script, hopefully it would find the right hands and be a bigger budget. But with the capabilities that we're able to just make them on ourselves, I really think it's just gonna get better and better. We literally carry around a camera in our pockets all the time that are better than the cameras that they used to shoot some of the greatest films on. So I think if it's used right, it's got a lot of potential. And like the, there's no one project, there's no one micro budget project that I regret making. Um, but as a whole, I feel like I've done way too many. Like you get to a point where, you know, like when you're starting out, you know, it's kind of, a, it's about building experience and getting credits on the board and, and, and just working in the business, you know, it, it's, it's cool. That said, you know, once you get, you know, five or six of those under your belt, you know, it can actually start working against you. 
you know, I, I went in for a meeting uh, about three years ago on a sizable budget. Um, you know, I think the I think the budget was around eight million, and I got you know this close to the project, and I feel that the major reason that that project that deal didn't close was because they didn't feel because of my resume and you know working on all of these low budget movies they didn't feel that i could handle the larger budget they they never said that implicitly but i i believe it i think i you know if you spend too much time at a certain level people just they think that's what you are you know so like i i feel like at a certain point you, you got to step it up or move on to something else